Welcome to lecture 23 for ECE 341 Random Processes. In this lecture, we're looking at the student t distribution. Now, the student t distribution is very much like a normal distribution. However, it takes sample size into account. With the t test, I can collect some data and compare the means. For example, I can take a bunch of 10 sided dice, roll them, and find out what is the mean of rolling 10 six sided dice or what's the probability of rolling more than 44.5. I can do Monte Carlo simulation and simulate a game of poker where, and then count how many times I draw three of a kind. With a t-test, I can then calculate what is the probability of drawing three of a kind. Or I can calculate the probability that April, or actually July, will break 90. Or the 9% confidence interval for the hottest day in April. Or how much energy AA battery has. Or how much What's the chance a AA battery has more than 500 milliamp hours? Those are things you can do with a student t-test. And the heart of the t-test is the central limit theorem. What that states is that all distributions converge to a normal distribution. And that's under a set of very general assumptions. Plus, you have the property that a norm normal distribution plus a normal distribution is a normal di distribution. So pretty much everything's a normal distribution. Uh, a normal distribution is defined by two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. That's if you have a sample size of infinity or you know the entire population. As, as an example, suppose I want to roll 10 six-sided dice. If I want to find the mean or the probability of rolling 45 or higher, there's a couple ways we can do that. One way we've looked at is to use convolution. I can find the PDF for rolling a six-sided die, convolve it to get 2d6, convolve that to get 4d6, 8d6, and 10d6. Then I can find what is the average of rolling 10 six-sided dice, and the average is 35. And I can find the probability of rolling 46 or 45 or higher, just by adding up the area at 45 or higher. And that'll be 3.9%. Well, that's one solution. A uh, second way to solve is to use the central limit theorem. That states that approximately, this is a normal distribution, the mean will be 35, the variance will be 29, and then I can calculate the z-score. That is, how far is 44.5 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? And so it kind of looks like your standard bell-shaped curve, like so. I want to take this distance, this is 44.5, how far is that from the mean in terms of standard deviations? And there's your z-score. That is 1.75 standard deviations away. And from a normal table, I can figure out what that is. Uh, another approach is I can go to StatTrack. And StatTrack, let's bring this over so you can see it. On normal distributions. And then tell it I am 1.7589 standard deviations away. Convert that to a probability. And it'll tell you eventually, maybe, that the probability is 3.9%. Well, student t-distribution is very much like a normal distribution. Um, however, instead of calling it a z-score, it's called a t-score. And the uh, t-score is just like a normal distribution. It's the distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations. However, instead of using the population's mean mu and the population standard deviation sigma, I use their estimate. The estimate of the mean is just the average of your data. And the standard deviation is the distance from the mean squared, but in this case, you divide by n minus 1. Two reasons for that. Uh, one, if I have a single data point, I can't estimate two parameters from a single data point. I need at least two, and that's what the n minus 1 tells you. If you only have a single data point, the standard deviation is infinity. You need at least two data points. The second reason is that's the thing called an unbiased estimator of the population standard deviation. 
But anyway, you divide by n minus 1. So that gives the estimated mean and standard deviation. Using that, I come up with the t-score. Looks just like the z-score, but it's called t-score, so I'm using estimates rather than the actual data. And there's a thing called degrees of freedom. That's your sample size minus 1. Uh, then I use the t-table to convert the t-score to a probability, just like a normal distribution. Uh, note, there is a slight difference between individuals and populations. If I'm going to roll the die a single time, I, I want to know how that's going to behave. That's an individual. That's where you use the standard deviation calculated here. If, on the other hand, I want to know something about the population, like what is the actual average of the six-sided dice, then I divide the variance by the sample size, or, equivalently, divide the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. And then to convert your t-score uh, to a probability, use a t-table. That looks like this. I've got my degrees of freedom right here. That takes the sample size into account. The area of the tail, just like a normal distribution, and then your t-score. And notice this guy right here. As sample size goes to infinity, this is a normal distribution. As the sample size gets smaller and smaller, the t-score goes up. What that means is if I only have a limited amount of data, like two data points, I've got to be kind of cautious, have a wide spread. As I get more and more data, I can be more and more certain what's going on. That's why this decreases as sample size goes up and eventually converges to the normal z-score. Uh, second way of doing that is in StatTrack. If you go down to distribution, and wait for it to respond, I get StatTrack's t-distribution calculator. So here you can input the sample size or degrees of freedom, say sample size of 1. I want to have 5% tails. Calculate. It'll tell you the t-score. Or given the t-score, calculate. It'll convert that to a probability. Examples. Suppose I want to roll 10 six-sided dice, like a level 10 fireball, and calculate what kind of damage do I expect. Well, if I roll the dice with time, I have no idea what that tells you. The standard deviation technically is infinity, so if I want to know something about the spread, I know with the sample size of 1, the die roll will be somewhere between minus infinity and plus infinity. Basically, sample size of 1 is meaningless. You need at least two measurements. If I roll the dice two times, I can actually do something. Rolling the dice twice, I'll get two data points. With that, I can find the mean and standard deviation. This is called x rather than mu, s rather than sigma. And this is a t-score, not or t-distribution, not a normal. If I want to know something about an individual, say next time I roll the dice, what's going to happen? Well, from a t-table, I can see that 5% tails is 6.31 standard deviations. I need to go left and right, 6.31 standard deviations from the mean, to catch the 90% confidence interval. So this tells me that, based upon those two rolls, I'm going to be 90% certain that my next roll will be somewhere between minus 6 and plus 73. Now that looks kind of odd, but that's because we only have two data points. you got to be really cautious when you don't have much data. I can even calculate what's the chance my next roll will be 44.5. That's just like we did in the normal distribution with a z-score, but now it's called a t-score. How far is 44.5 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? It's 1.7285 standard deviations away. From here, calculate the probability. Or actually, stat trek is easier. It's 1.7285 minus 1.7285 standard deviations away. I want to find out what's the probability. Calculate. And eventually it gives a number. 16.69%. For the population, if I want to know something about the population, then in that case I divide by square root of n. So suppose I want to find out what is the actual average of rolling 10 six-sided dice. Based upon, on, upon my two data points, I need to go left and right 
6.31 standard deviations, but in this case, I divide by population, my sample standard deviation, by the square root of the sample size. So that says I'm 90% certain that the average is somewhere between 5 and 61. I know the answer is 35, but based upon only two data points, I can tell you something. It's not real certain, but I can tell you something. And there, based upon the two data points, there is a chance that the average is more than 39.5. Find your t-score. Again, the standard deviation I'm dividing by the square root of the sample size. Tells me there's a 20% chance that the average is more than 39.5 based upon only two data points. Now, as you collect more and more data, I get more information. So suppose I roll the dice five times. I'll have the mean standard deviation. If I want to find out what's the probability that I'll roll what's my 90% confidence interval for my next roll, that's an individual. In this case, I'm going to go down to four degrees of freedom, sample size of five, and there's my t-score. I need to go left and right, 2.13 standard deviations. And my next roll will be somewhere between 24 and 44. Chance that my next roll will be more than 44.5. Find your t-score. Convert to a probability, 4.83%. In terms of the population, Um, I'm getting a much tighter range, more idea of what the actual mean is. What's doing that are two things. First, as my sample size increases, my degrees of freedom go up and my t-score drops. Second, I divide by the square root of the sample size. As the sample size goes up, this gets smaller. Gives you better and better idea of what the actual population's mean is. So now I know somewhere between 29.9 and 38. And still, there's a chance that the population means more than 39.5. If I roll the dice 21 times, I now have 20 degrees of freedom. And I need to go left and right, 1.73 standard deviations. For an individual, this spread isn't changing a whole lot. That's because when I roll 10 six-sided dice, it's got some spread. The t-score starts out fairly broad and then converges to a normal distribution, this won't change. On the other hand, for a population, again, this number is getting smaller, this number is getting smaller, I've got a tighter confidence interval for where the population's mean is, and I can now tell you that I'm pretty certain that the population's mean is not bigger than 39.5. And finally, just for fun, roll the dice 1,001 times. I'm now pretty darn close to normal distribution. These two numbers are different, but not that far off. Again, for an individual, nothing's really changed. Again, I'm converging to what the actual spread is for normal distribution. I'm converging to the actual probability that I'll roll bigger than 45 or bigger. That was 3.9% from before. However, for populations, I have a much tighter band for where the population's mean is. I can't tell you what it is exactly. It's supposed to be 35.0000. But as my sample size goes up and up, I can get a tighter and tighter band for what the population's mean actually is. And I can also tell you I'm really certain, I'm 26 standard deviations out, I'm really certain that the mean is not more than 39.5. So that's kind of the idea of the t-test. You might think I need a large sample size, but actually you don't. I need at least a sample size of two. Let's go back to a t-table. Here's the t-table. I need at least a sample size of two to tell you anything. I get a big improvement when I go sample size of two to three to four. Then I start getting diminishing returns. If I only have a sample size of four, uh, meaning three degrees of freedom, I can still tell you quite a bit about the population. That's actually good. In industry, when I want to know what my product is that I'm selling, I need to, to test it. The problem is, if I test everything, I have nothing to sell and I go bankrupt. If I test nothing, I have no idea what my product is. T-table kind of tells you that if I only have two measurements, I can do something. 
I would really like to have three, maybe four. With four measurements, I have a pretty good idea of the product that I'm selling. And only have four items that have to be sold as used because I tested them. But you can usually dump those on eBay. And sometimes on eBay you get more than the actual selling price. But that's eBay for you. Uh, T-Test kind of tells you you don't need a huge sample size to tell you what's going on. So that was with rolling dice. Let's do a second example of drawing cards. We can find out where we were. Or, or here's a summary. Again, for an individual, this is converging to a normal distribution, saying the spread for a single roll is going to cover some range, and there's a certain probability, 3.9% chance, that will roll more than 44.5. For the population, as the sample size increases, I get a tighter and tighter band, and eventually I can tell you what the population's mean really is very precisely. But to do that, I need a sample size going to infinity. And kind of note, for individuals versus populations, if we're talking about a population, S goes to S over the square root of sample size. So you need to kind of pay attention. Am I talking about an individual or population? Second example. At the beginning of the semester, we looked at calculating the odds of poker hands. For example, what's the, what are the odds of being dealt three of a kind and five card stud? Well, with enumeration, we could go through all 2.5 million combinations of, of hands and count. How many of them were three of a kind? And the answer was 54,912. We covered combinatorics. With combinatorics, I can calculate how many different hands are three of a kind, and it's the same answer, 54,912, or 2.11%. Third approach that it kind of goes with a t test is I can run a Monte Carlo simulation and count how many times I get three of a kind when I deal out 100,000 hands. The problem is every time I run a Monte Carlo simulation, I get a different answer. So, how do I use that data to come up with what's the probability of getting three of a kind? That's a t test. So, the first step is you need some data. For example, I took the previous code that we had, dealt out 100,000 hands of a uh, five card stud and counted uh, how many times it got three of a kind. Then it repeated 11 times. And here's my results. Take the data, find the mean, find the standard deviation, sample size. Now let's start doing some t-tests. And again, individuals versus population. There's a difference. Suppose I want to know, next time I run that program, what's the 90% confidence interval? Again, kind of going back to here, uh, sometimes the number is fairly low, like 2037. Sometimes it got a lot of three of a kinds, like 2230. What range of numbers am I going to get 90% of the time? This is an individual. Again, next time I deal the hands, so I don't divide by square root of n. I just take the standard deviation and go left and right. I need to use a t-table to say I have a sample size of 11, meaning 10 degrees of freedom. I need to go left and right, 1.812, standard deviations. So do that. Go that far left, go that far right. And the answer is 90% of the time, I'll get somewhere between 2014 and 2207 hands. I can calculate what's the chance I get lucky, and I have more than 2,200 three-of-a-kinds. Well, that, that's a t-score, t-test. How far is 2,199.5 from the mean in terms of standard deviations? I'm 1.66 standard deviations away. Again, from a t-table, or a stat track is actually easier. Convert that to a probability. The probability is 6.34%. Population. What is the actual probability of being dealt three of a kind? Again, I can't tell you that precisely, but I can give you confidence interval. This is a population. Again, this is actually a number. I'm trying to estimate it. So I divide by square root of n. I need to go left and right, 1.812 standard deviations. But now I divide the standard deviation by square root, square root of 11, square root of the sample size. So this says that the 
probability is somewhere in this range. I can't tell you what it is precisely, but it's somewhere between 2082 and 2140. And we calculated it, it's actually 2112, so that seems consistent. And I can sit there and give an upper bound. What is the, what are the odds of getting more than 2150, three of a kinds and 100,000 hands? Again, that's the distance to the mean in terms of standard deviations. There's only a 1.7% chance that the actual probability of getting three of a kind is bigger than 2150. So that's kind of two things you can do with t-tests. Another one, I can look at weather. If you go to Hector Airport, it has the monthly highs, lows, and average in Fargo since 1942. That's 80 years of data. Here's what it looks like. Again, some hot years, some not so hot years. What's the probability it's going to break 100 degrees this coming July? Again, we did that before using a normal distribution. Technically, that's actually t distribution because I have a sample. So given your data, I find the mean, find the standard deviation, just like we did before. Find the degrees of freedom, that's your sample size minus one. Now I find the distance from the mean of 100 degrees in terms of standard deviations. That's technically a t-score because I have a finite sample size. I'm estimating the mean and the standard deviation from the sample. So that's really t, not a normal distribution. To find out what's this area, I need to find out that distance from the mean in terms of standard deviations is 1.3423 standard deviations away. Going to StatTrack, 1.3423, I can say let's go, I've got 79 degrees freedom, 1.3423. freedom, 1.3423 standard deviations away calculate, and it's 9.17%. I can say, what's the 90% 90, 90 confidence interval for the high this coming, coming July? Again, from StatTrack, I want to find out how far do I have to go for the tails to be 5%. That's 1.665. Again, a little bit different than a normal distribution. I think a normal is 1.664. You know, pretty close. Uh, good that many deviations left and right. And it says that this July, it'll be somewhere between 87 and 101. Again, this is the individual for a single year this coming July. That's how hot it's going to be with a probability of 0.9. And likewise, the stat track. Finally, I can do an experiment, such as I could say, given a AA battery, how much energy is in that AA battery? Well, first I have to collect some data. One way to do that is to connect a AA battery across a 10 ohm resistor, measure the voltage every six seconds for seven hours, and then calculate the power. Power is V squared over R. That's the energy being dissipated in watts. Integrate, and then I'll get the energy in joules. So doing that, I set up four AA batteries. The reason for four is I need at least two. Uh, sample size of one is meaningless. And AA batteries come in a four pack, so I measured four. And this is the voltage versus time. It starts out at 1.5 volts initially and pretty quickly drops down to about 1.2 volts, stays fairly constant, and then drops off. That's the discharge characteristic. I think this was, was an alkaline AA battery. Uh, brand we won't mention. But anyway, here's your data. Now here's a problem for you. Do a t-test on this data. If I could convert that data to a number, I'd have four numbers. With four numbers, I can find the mean, standard deviation. I can do something with four numbers. I don't know what to do with the graph. So somehow I've got to convert this to a number. A couple ways to do that. I could say, what is the voltage at 200 minutes? That gives me four numbers. I'm not exactly sure what they tell you, but that's four numbers. I could do the time until one volt. 
That's actually how batteries are rated. It's how long does it take to discharge down to one volt, and I get four numbers. Four numbers I can do something with. I'm going to use a third approach. If this is the voltage, I know that the power is V squared over R. It's a 10 ohm resistor, so it's V squared over 10. If I integrate power, I get watts. Correction, I get joules. Remember my units here. Joules is the integral uh, V squared over 10 dt. So let's do that. That's kind of the area under the curve, sort of, is actually V squared over 10. That area gives you joules. So doing that, in MATLAB, I can just say, let's take all the data, add it up. That's the height. The width is 6 seconds. It was 6 seconds per sample. The watts is V squared over R, V squared over 10. And here's what I get. I get four numbers. That's what I want. If I have four numbers, I can find the mean, standard deviation. I can start doing data analysis. So doing that, I can find the mean, 3056 joules, find the standard deviation, 111.8. I can start answering questions. Like, what is the 90% confidence interval? Get in stat track, I'll say, how far left and right do I have to go for the tails to be 5%? I need to go left and right 2.355 standard deviations. So doing that, take the mean plus and minus 2.355 standard deviations gives you 2793 to 3319. And this is individual. Any individual battery will have that much energy in it based upon my measurements. Um, with a probability of 0.9. I can see, well, that's what it looks like. There's my PDF. Here's the mean, standard deviation. And this is 2.355. This distance is 2.355 standard deviations. And that's my T-score. I can find out what percentage of batteries meet, meet requirements. Now, AA batteries are rated for 500 milliamp hours. If I convert that to joules, 500 milliamp hours at 1.5 volts is 2,700 joules. So, what's the area under the curve uh, to the left of 2,700 joules? So, that's your T score. Take this distance, the distance from the mean to 2700, in terms of standard deviations, is 3.187 standard deviations away. From StatTrack, find the probability, 2.51%. So 2.5% of the batteries will not meet, meet specs based upon this data. Or 97.49% do meet specs. So in summary, if you know the mean and the standard deviation for a population, then you use the normal distribution. If, on the other hand, I have to estimate the mean and standard deviation using my data, that's technically a student t distribution. That takes the sample size into account. And a couple things to note. A sample size of 1 is meaningless. The sample size of 1, the standard deviation is infinity, and so my confidence level is, or confidence interval will be like minus infinity to plus infinity. Not terribly useful. Second thing to note, you really only need two measurements. With only two measurements, you can do something. It would really help to have three or four or five. The T-score drops pretty dramatically when I go from one degree of freedom to two to three. Um, however, you get diminishing returns. So Usually, once you get past four or five, there's no point sampling anymore. And finally, if you're estimating something related to population, then the standard deviation goes to S divided by square root of sample size. So we want to say, what is the average for, what is the population's average? Then I divide by the square root of N. If I just want to say, next time I roll the dice, what's going to happen? Then I do not divide by square root of N. 
So that's lecture number 23 for EC3, ECE341 random processes.